And it turns into red, right? Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. Okay, take your seats. We are starting Pesach. And the hundreds of years the Jewish people spent in Mitzrayim. That's going to be our topic. So let us begin it by looking at the word itself. I don't know what the words mean, right? The word is Mitzrayim. Now, what can we see inside that word that may reveal something to us before we even start the topic itself? What does Mitzrayim even mean? So it's going to refer to a geographical location that we know is present-day Egypt. And that's going to be part of the discussion. But we're more interested in the idea that goes behind it. So what's the idea? The idea can be found in the word. Can you see any other words inside there? Yes, Ariella. Um, meats. What? Like what? Like meats, too. Oh, meat. Yeah, no, okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Tsar. Tsar, okay. So the actual word is meitzar. What's a meitzar? What's a meitzar? You don't know that word. That's why you're in my class here to learn what the word means. I should put you in the right place. Meitzar means a narrow confine confined okay what's that Pearl. Yeah. Oh, yeah. water sea. water sea. sea okay what else could it mean well actually it was mean the numerical value is 10 and that's 40. just put that in your heads just put that in your heads okay so we have over here 50 as a total mm. Trapped. Narrow Trapped. Confined. Narrow confined. Narrow confined, actually, is Meitzar. Is Meitzar. Tsar means tight, narrow street. I want to plant that into your heads before the class actually begins so that we can maybe see how it fits in. It's it just Meitzar. Yeah. No, no. Meitzar is a narrow confine. So where do you put 50 now? Is Yud and Mem. Numerical value. There'll be other things we get out of that word. The words always represent something that's happening in there. <coughs> Let's have a look at the Torah because Avram Avinu was told many years before we even got there that his descendants would be in a foreign land. Welcome back. Yeah. What's your new name? Levi. Levi. Yeah. <laughs> 46. It's 46? Right. In Pesach, yeah. Let's have a look at the Pasuk. Vayome Allah Vani Hashem. Hashem spoke to Avram and said, I am the Lord your God. Hotei Tichum Urkastim. Took you out of Urkastim. Right? That's where Avram Vinu was originally. Latet Lachat Ha'eretz Hazod Rishta. I'm going to give you a land in order that you'll be able to inherit it. Vayomer Hashem B'maidak Yerushena. How am I going to know, Hashem, that this is the land? What am I going to see? What's going to be the sign? So he over here, seemingly, Chazal seemed to mention that Ravinu was punished for saying this, for having this little bit of doubt, and his descendants would end up in Mitzrayim. And that's the Gemara in the Dorim. Everyone looking inside? Amar Amar Rabbi why was he punished? The Jewish people were in Egypt 210 years was the length of this particular exile. This is not one of the four exiles, but inside it were all the other exiles. It's the paradigm of all the other galuts the Jewish people would find themselves in. Okay? He seemed to say, how am I going to know that we're going to get it? There was a little bit of doubt over there. What's the sign? For that, seemingly, there was a... Abraham Yeah. Yeah. Have a look. That's Rashi. I'm going to know. Avram doubted Hashem's credibility in fulfilling His promise. That's Rashi. Right. As you can see, how will I know? I'll inherit the land. How am I going to know? At his level, there was something there. And for that reason, he had to, the Jewish people, his descendants, had to go into this land. Now there's going to be many other benefits and reasons and challenges and all the rest of it that we're going to see from this uh, sojourn in Mitzrayim. It's going to be a major part of who we are as a people. We're going to come to that. 
Let's have a look at the Maral, page 46, yeah. Very, very good. That's a very, very fair question. They didn't actually do it. It's maybe see it like the consequences. There was something in him that was lacking. Therefore, it was a sign, must have some abundance, that his descendants would be lacking in this area too. They would need to grow in faith by going through this experience. So it was a sign of something else. They weren't being punished for what he did. There was something in him that they had to go through this experience, a punishing experience. That's more of what it is. That's more of what it is. Says the Maharal, Hashem placed, Hashem is brachi viet zera avram begalus. He put him into galut. Mipnei shloi avram avinu mitchazek al kach baimuna. There was something avram avinu, this is the Maharal answering your question, Rachel. There's something avram avinu that was lacking a little bit, or strengthening in his emuna. So Hashem brought the Jewish people into Egypt so they could have emuna. So why are we in Mitzrayim? Says the Maharal. This experience wasn't just to punish, to hurt. It was a training ground. It was a breeding ground for emuna. For emuna, for faith. We had to go through this in order to build faith. So Avravina was lacking a small smidgen. That had to be fixed and ended up being through his descendants. Hashem actually was doing this to help us. There was some very great benefit that would come out of this experience. Many people would get lost along the way. Not everyone is going to make it out. Just like, uh, I don't know, the Marine Corps. You may want to go in, but not everyone gets out, and not everyone left. Ideally, they want everyone to graduate. The Jewish people went into college for 210 years in a school of Amunah. That was Mizraim. That's what he's saying. Kumash HaSal Mizraim, in a Makadola of Anarod, Patobar Shal Oivav. And Hashem eventually helped us by removing us at the end, because we could not get out. We were totally trapped in this place. That's the Meitzar. We were physically trapped. We're going to see. We were also spiritually trapped as well. We're also going to see, God willing, that the Mitzrayim wasn't just a place and an event. It's an ongoing challenge. It's going to be a paradigm that we have to go through in order to get us out. Now, the Torah refers to Egypt in a very unusual way. Look at the bottom of the page. This is in Devarim, Peret Dalet, Pasuk Chav. Lakach Hashem, and you Hashem took out, v'yotzietchem mikor habarzel, from the kor habarzel, it's a very interesting expression. Kor basel. What's the kor habarzel? Kor basel is a is a smelting furnace, an iron crucible, an iron crucible. What does that mean? What's an iron crucible? What do they do in that? So when you want to purify gold, you have to in its raw state. You make it very very hot. And by making it very hot, you separate the dross, the stuff you don't want, from the gold, the stuff you do want. And the bad stuff kind of separates out and it gets like scooped off. But it has to be at a very hot temperature. The Torah itself refers to Mikura Barazal Memitzrayim. Egypt is referred to in the Torah as the Kor Habarzal, the very hot iron crucible that is there to purify. It sounds painful, and it was. It's hot, it's uncomfortable, but through that there is a purification that happened to our ancestors by going through that experience. <speaking in Hebrew> to be a nation of heritage for him, as this very day. That's what the Torah said. This is our Mosh- Moshe Rabbeinu speaking at the end of the Torah in Devarim. He said, 40 years ago, we went through this experience called the Kora Barazel. By doing that, we became an Am. A prerequisite to getting to Har Sinai is Mitzrayim. The two are bookends. There is a 49 day gap between both of them. Actually, 50 till you get to Har Sinai. We count 49 days. So we see the 50 
He's going to be one of the numbers encoded in this story as well. Yeah. Is there any correlation with Cora Barzell and the golden calf? Because it sounds familiar. Like, like, it sounds it sounds like it. Um, like, did they put the gold in the not fire probably. The did they did smell it? Could be. I've never read anything on it. Could be. I hear where your mind is going, Shifra. I hear you. Turn over the page. That's what Rashi says. Says Rashi, Mekor, what is this? Kora Barzel, who kli, it's a vessel, Shem Mizkakim Bo Esazahab, that purifies gold. If you want gold to be pure, you've got to burn it. You've got to heat it up. That, says the Ksav Kabbalah, the Kora Barzel, Kor, Kli Mizkakim Bo Esazahab, this was the main purpose, Hamiti, the true purpose. Why did Hashem put us into Egypt? To purify us. Right? Being put in this challenging, painful now, it started off well, remember. Right? Yosef went down and we were on top over there, and Paro loved us, and then a Melech Hadash came, a new king, different opinions. Some say real Melech, a new king took over. Some say the old king with new decrees. And Rav Sanfel Hirsch actually says that the whole country was taken over by an outside king who came in and saw these Jews and were like, no, 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 we're not having this. And started to subjugate <coughs> us. Whichever methodology went through, and one of those three is true, still, it was a very painful experience and that's what it turned into. And we suffered. However, it was purifying. Lutzarafam, Kazav. We're like gold, but gold has to be clear. Right? The Korosh is paradu a sigin that takes out all the schmutz. Bishazav, taralavad. You're going to end up with pure gold at the end. You're going to lose stuff along the way. But that's what's going to end up at the end. Chalas aposhe mesu bimechoshech. We know that a whole bunch died off in the maka of which plague in Choshech. That's right. How many people left Mitzrayim. What percentage of the Jewish people one left fifth, Egypt? One Only one fifth. Chamushim Ya'alu. 80% stayed behind. That is hinted at in the Pasuk. We're going to see right now. Go to the next the source. Word, the word art, right? Different opinions. Let's have a look. The Chamushim Alu B'nei Yisrael Yeretz Yisrael. They left Chamushim. So the basic translation is armed. They, they were armed with weapons, ready to go to war because they knew they were going to be attacked once they left. That's one interpretation. However, Rashi gives another one. Only one in five got out. Four fifths died out in the darkness. Yeah. In the Makkah of darkness. They died. Why? Because the Mitzrayim would not see it. It would have been an embarrassment. They would have seen these people die out. By the way, I've heard from other, I've read and I've heard from other sources that no, actually, they didn't all die out. Many of them just stayed behind. They didn't want to go. <coughs> no. They're like, we don't want to go. We want to be part of it, Egyptian society. Only 20% decided they want out. Right? Only the pure gold to put the metaphor, the Torah's metaphor into play. Okay. So we saw the Korah Barzal. We wrote that down, the translation. We saw the Ksav Kabbalah on that. And we're like, well, what does that mean? So it says that only a few left. Only the pure gold were able to be scooped out and redeemed at that time. And they're the ones that got to Har Sinai. The others were not worthy of it. Interestingly enough, sadly enough, what percentage of Jewish people would you say are really... Oh, let's use Shabbos as the paradigm of the observant Jew. as reasons why. Why do we use, let's use Shabbos? What percentage of Jewish people would you say are Shabbos in the world today? Show me Shabbos. I'm saying about 15 to maximum 20, maybe Eris Israel, but 15. People are really still a connection to Torah. Anyway, those, but it's not a happy situation. We're not happy with that. Right? The idea when we went in was that all should leave. That was the ultimate goal. Okay? That's the Pasuk, that's the Rashi. Let's have a look at the Svas Emes. What was the purpose of this whole experience? Look at the Svas Emes at the bottom. It's a beautiful piece, this. What was the, the purpose of the exodus from Egypt? It's for us to know. You see, every other time nations escaped from other nations, by the way, not left Egypt. Egypt was on major lockdown. As I mentioned before, it was the North Korea of its day. 
no one got out. Maybe one or two people, but a nation being taken out was unheard of. Right? I mean, think about now, with all the modern technology we have, you still have millions of people trapped in the country. Back then, it was easier to do. They trapped you. The whole purpose that we should know that Hashem took us out. Now, we're going to read this in the Haggadah. What do we say in the Haggadah? Ani v'lo malach. Ani v'lo saraf. It was me, not an angel. It was me, not a fiery uh, angel. Hashem himself went in, kivichol, and took us out. You see, he's saying, what is going to do for us? It's going to keep us humble. Humility is one of the key things that's going to represent our mission in this world. And a person could say, It's my strength and my abilities that did all this for me. And our beginnings as a people are very, very humble. How did our nation begin, the Jewish people? How did we begin as a nation? What were we? We were shepherds. And then we became slaves. We became brick schleppers. That's our beginnings. It was our beginnings were very, very humble. Did we fight out? Did the Jewish people have a big war to get out? No. We <coughs> walked out because Hashem let us out. That is how we left Mitzrayim. That's how we left Egypt. Okay? So Hashem brought us to a state of helplessness to show that everything is from God. So our very beginning, the genesis of our people as a nation, there were people before, but really the Jewish people were formed at this time. This is when Jewish People Inc. got going. And it's very, very humbling. That's the Spasamis. That's how we started. You would have thought, nah, it can't be. We start off as slaves, then we buy the company, then we get other Egyptian workers. That's not what happened. We were taken out as slaves. Now, we're going to see it's going to be <coughs> troubles for that. Because of that as well, that's the problem. Okay? Ah, look at the next page. Call Hagalataita the Varer. The entire exile was to show that Karish Baruch Hu Meshach Olama Bishvil Bnei Israel that Hashem is going to turn over the entire world for the Jewish people. Now I think we mentioned this before. We mentioned that Purim was hidden miracles. What started at Mitzrayim and carried on afterwards is revealed miracles. Up to this point in the Torah, there are no revealed miracles. There are no nes nigla. It's all hidden miracles. Now we have stories in Midrash about Avram Avinu being thrown into Kibshana, each being thrown into the fiery furnace, right, by Nimrod. But that's not in the Torah. It's a Midrash, right? It's a Midrash, yeah. That's not in the Torah itself. Why not? Because the Gorosh Baruch's relation to the world changed at this time. It's going to be a very important role. He was Kel Shakai, the name of God, which is Kel, Aleph and the Lamed, and the Shakai, the Shin, with the Dalad and the Yud. That's Hashem's creation. But we don't see Hashem, the name of God that it changes into, there's four names of Hashem that it relate to, is the Yud with the Hay, with the Vav with the Hay. That's the miraculous name of Hashem. And that's why we'll see that our boss says, we go in and tell the Israel that this is the name, Hashem no Datalem, I'm giving them my new name. Of course, he changed his name, but I change of passport. No, this is the miraculous. So another major part, we're going to go to this introduction, we're going to go to all of these pieces individually. We're going to go through all the Makos, and we're going to talk about Chris Yamsa, we're going to get to Har with Shavuos, all revealed miracles. And these revealed miracles are going to carry on right up to the Hanukkah story, which is pretty much the end of the revealed miracle stories. Yeah. What was the change with the name of Pasha Kailat? To Yud K with the Hay, Vav and the Hay. That name of Hashem is the miraculous name. That is Lamala Melateva. That's Hashem's name of Rachem of mercy. And Hashem shows his mastery over the world with that. That's why he says, too much Rabbi, go in and tell them. This is all the same source, like They're all different pieces to it. Okay. We're going to pieces to it. Like yeah. 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 Now I'm going to do Rav Desla. Now what? Rav Desla on page 48. Number seven. So we're facing all the benefits and the challenges. Let's, let's, we've done a lot, yeah? Should we just recap a little bit? Is that what you want to do? Yeah. Okay, let's start again. The Jewish people were told, Avram Avinu was told, because of some lack of amuna, as it were, whatever that means at his level, because he wanted certain proof of something, there was something lacking, his descendants would have this problem too. They would need an amuna training course, a course in faith. 
What was that going to be? Hashem, for his reasons, decided that we would become slaves. Now, it doesn't say who to. Right? The Egyptians stepped up. And there's another question on this. If they were doing what Hashem wanted, why were they punished? That's another question. If they were just tools of Hashem, then why were they punished at all? They were just doing what Hashem wanted. There's many answers to this. They enjoyed it. They made it harder. They made it much more than it had to be. That's the short answer to it. They got a lot more enjoyment out of it and took more advantage of it than it should have. Mm-hmm. Of having this nation inside their nation. Oh, see. Yeah. Then we said, fine. So what was Egypt about? So Egypt was there to help us have a Muna. Where do we see this? Well, we actually see in the word Kor HaBarzal, which is the way the Torah itself describes Mitzrayim. It's a metaphor. What is a Kor HaBarzal? It's a vessel, a kli, says Rashi, that purifies gold. How do you do that? You throw all the gold in, a whole bunch of stuff kind of like oozes out of it. We throw it, that stuff is not needed, it's put aside, and we keep the pure gold. Where do we see that Mitzrayim? Well, it happens to be only, the, only 20% of the Jewish people left Mitzrayim. The other stayed behind or died out in the Makkah of Choshech. So only a few, a small group, 20% got to leave. Now, everyone was invited to leave, but they didn't want to. So they obviously didn't pick up the lesson of Mitzrayim. So Mitzrayim wasn't just torture. It wasn't a random country we're kept in, but Hashem himself put us in there. It says the Sfas Emes, Hashem himself took us out. That was the purpose of Mitzrayim. Hashem himself took us out. Not an angel. We didn't fight our way out. The key is that Hashem took us out. What else do we learn from this experience? Humility. Humility. Our beginnings were very, very humble. We're going to be very successful. We're going to become doctors and lawyers and parents and all the rest of it. That's not how we started. We are humbled by this information. Let's look at Rav Desla, who's going to give another little aspect of it. Rav Desla was a rabbi who lived in Europe, then moved to England, the north of the England Gate, and then to Eretz Yisrael. And he writes a lot. This is one of his themes that he talks about. And he tries to give a little perspective on this Mitzrayim experience. The whole palm, every time, Shayat Sorachatet Sadik, when you want to give a righteous person, F Sharut the ability, Lehit Allah Lama Drake and Leonamo to go up to a high level. Whenever you see in the Torah or in a country or a life, a person's life, a person's personal life, that Hashem wants to lift up a person to a higher level, what does he do? Nizrak El Sviva Tashfeina Biyote Grum Laman. He throws them down into the worst environment. This is a general concept. We see this with Yosef. Yosef is going to be called a tzaddik. Before he refers to that, he has to spend time in, in jail. In jail, Egypt, and then in jail, it gets from bad to worse. Right? So you have to be thrown down in order to go up. That is one of the ways Hashem created this world. Yilmad mem et pachito tara v'itamet ad maram pitzo. He should learn that evil is futile but be thrown into a prison, right? And strive to reach the highest limits. It's interesting. I, on the way here, I was listening to a shear of Chief Rabbi Warren Goldstein. Chief Rabbi of... You ever heard of him? Wow. Oh. Of South Africa. Shabbos Project? That's his creation. So he was giving a speech recently, and he was talking about uh, Nelson Mandela. Actually, actually, he was giving this speech, actually, he was still alive. It was about a year and a half, two years ago. And he said that he only became who he was by having, he spent 27 years in prison for trying to break up apartheid in South Africa. And you see this. People get thrown into the worst environments. They see, Zachary Tessa is saying how futile evil is. Then they use that as a way to get out and bring other people with them. And how do we see Anatoly Sharansky? Natan Sharansky, you know, heard of him before? Any Russians here? Russian families? You heard of Anatoly Sharansky? You heard of him? I just saw him. You saw him. I'm a big fan of his. He was the first refusenik. He was the first one who was put into prison for teaching Hebrew in Russia. And they put him in solitary confinement and imprisoned him for the crime of teaching Judaism in Hebrew for many years. And eventually he was the first one to get out under Reagan. He got out. He wrote books and has a very important person there as his strong. As is his very special wife. Anyway, 
he writes in his books, of which I've read a couple of them, that by going into jail and solitary confinement for decades actually formed him to who he was. He said, I went through that experience and I saw how futile evil can be. And because of that, I, he didn't leave a bitter, twisted person. He used that experience to improve himself and the world. And by the way, he was really the first one to kind of break through the Russian wall, if you will. And all the Russian jury got out. What was his name? Natan Sharansky is his name. Is his name. Anatoly Sharansky. He's got a great book called Fear No Evil. It talks about his experiences, his years in prison. An extraordinary individual. And a chess master. And a Shemesh Shabbos. Gam Yisrael, similarly the Jewish people, when they needed to be prepared for Matan Torah. So we're connecting these events. See, everyone keeps Pesach out there. Everyone's involved in Pesach, but no one keeps Shavuos. Right? Everyone's sitting around the Pesach table, like eating the matzah, drinking the wine, and you know, when's the chicken coming, honey? Right? But the whole reason we left Mitzrayim was to get the, to Matan Torah, to Shavuot. Actually, the whole reason we were in Mitzrayim in the first place was to get us there. It's the whole purpose. It was all hachana el Kabbalah to Torah. We would not have got the Torah had we not gone through Mitzrayim. That was a necessary prerequisite for that event. Are we clear on that? God didn't send us, you know, I had to prepare for Matan Torah, send him off to Yeshiva for the year. And I spent, what is it, $15,000, let him go to Yeshiva, tell him not to hang up Ben Yehuda, tell him to go to Yeshiva and learn a little bit, go to seminary, and then off you go. Now you get to be like, no, that's not what happened. That's not what happened. Hashem Misham Lekach Mosh Rabbein Allah Misham Torah. El Ha'ar was the exact opposite. Our preparation wasn't one of spiritual fantasticness. Our whole experience was the exact opposite. We got put down into the schmushiest, schmutziest place in the world. They say Mitzrayim was the most defiled, repugnant nation of its day. And the Jewish people were in the capital. Where's the capital? Or the center. Of course, there wasn't the capital. We were in the city of Goshen in Goshen, which they say was the schmutziest of the schmutziest. We were put in the worst environment, spiritual environment that existed in the world of the day. That was our preparation for Kabbalah to Torah. I'll see what he says. El avadim shel bale mem teshari tuma. So, here's a concept which is mentioned, I think it's Kabbalah, but it's mentioned elsewhere. There are 49 levels of impurities that exist in this world. 49 levels, memtes shari tuma. Corresponding to this, we're going to need this information to understand the Omer, which is the period between Pesach and Shavuot. Corresponding to this are 49 levels of being of great understanding. Moshe Rabbeinu reached the 49th level. 50th he never got to, because 50 is... No human could reach such a level in this world. So we went down to the lowest point that existed. It was very difficult. We weren't Sadiqim, it was tough. We were involved in stuff we shouldn't have been involved. It was a very difficult time. Had we stayed one more year, or one more day, I should say, actually, we would never have left. The remaining 20% would still be there. By the way, this 80% that did not leave, they are not Jewish. They may be related to us through blood, but I guess unless you reach Harsina, you don't become Jewish. Are we clear on that? So it's not like Jews stayed behind. They were not Jews. They not, we became an um at Harsina. Are we clear on this? So are there descendants of the 80% that stayed behind? Those are Jewish today? Not Jewish. They're not Jewish. So, like, think they're Jewish today? They're, they're not so they think they're Jewish, but they're blood relatives somehow. Sure. But they don't question, so they yeah, stay absolutely. behind? But they're not Jewish. Egypt only gets them its Mitzrayim. Most died out, but many stayed behind. Yeah. They, they stayed behind because they were scared to leave. So, were they scared to leave? They felt they were Egyptians. Right? And it was scary. 
Right? They went into a place, the Eret Lozerua, into the Midbar. The Jewish people are greatly praised by the prophets for willing to leave Mitzrayim, which was the epicenter of the world. It was the main metropolis. The Jewish people have taken two journeys. One of them was Moshe, was Avram Avinu leaving Ur Kasim, going off to Eretz Yisrael. There wasn't much to speak of in those days. And the other was the Jewish people leaving Israel to go into a desert. This was a suicide mission. It was, we had to put all their faith in God. Right? Where did they get this? By being in Israel, by seeing the Makos, right? by seeing all the miracle, the Korban Pesach, all this prepared them for it. But as far as they were concerned, it was done. It was very, very, it was a big, big gamble for them. Only some people had the Emunah to do this. In Israel, they were on the flaming bubble of Israel. Yeah. They went right down. That's what he says. Right? The Mem test, they went right down. But don't we also have like 49 levels of evil and race of like, isn't there like a, a source that says that Paro was on the 40, like on the highest level of evil? Like yes, evil. he was right down there. And Moshe had to be on the equivalent. He was. Level. We're basically going to have 49 days to take us out of this to Har Sinai. That's why there's that amount of days. And I've seen it on the 50th. Yeah. That's what's going to be. It's exactly, it's going to be a balance, counterbalance, get us out of there no, and into there. Yeah. Yeah. By the way, we, we mean it. When it says in Haggadah, had we not left that day, we would never have left. It was literally, we would just got out. One more day and we were completely assimilated and become Egyptian. Because Hashem took us out. That was always the plan. <laughs> that was never happen. You're saying that was always going to happen. I hear, well, but who was, who was going to, I hear what you're saying. Hashem is always ahead of the game. However, who's going to be part of the plan is the question. Who was going to be the ones who decided, I'm in? That's always the question. Well, we learned that from the Megillah, right? What did Mordechai say to Esther? He said, he says, the Jewish people are going to be saved. The question is, are you going to do it or someone else going to do it? And, and he says, don't think you're going to be saved if you stay behind. Remember he said that? Same thing. Oh, I like that comparison. I feel good. <laughs> okay. Right, so they were not only the Meitzar, it wasn't just a physical Meitzar, it was a spiritual Meitzar as well. And let him finish. The slavery brought them a place where they called out to Hashem, they cried out to Hashem. That was the ultimate goal. As to Shuvah, they returned to Hashem, they did to Shuvah, Zu Shetchila Mina Hefecho Shigam Lahem Lalot Ad Madreka Balata Torah. So they got so low, it was so bad, they were being tortured, they were slaves, right? The children were being killed, and they eventually cried out, and spiritually they were broken beings. They cried out to Hashem, and Hashem took them out. Whose merit did they leave? In whose merit did the Jewish people get out? That was the promise they would get out. Avram was promised they would get out in the, of the Nashim Tzidkaniot, the holy Jewish women. We'll see what they did oh, to merit. It was their holy nature. Right? The women were the redeemers of the entire Jewish people. It was their Zuchot. Is that why women, like the Bracha that we say, like, she has signed to her mouth, or being like in the will of God, versus like. Very nice. I've not had that before. I like it. <laughs> but it was their merit. That's why, by the way, all the mitzvot of Pesach, although there's Zaman Grama, women have to keep as well. First of all, they were saved, so they have to keep all the mitzvot, because they were part of that original redemption. But because in the merit of the holy Jewish women, they all got out. Does anyone know what they did in order to merit that? What was the... Didn't they, didn't they like, dress up for their husbands? Right. They kept children coming. The husband's like, we're not having kids over here. This is madness. And the women said, we've got to. Where do we see a young Jewish woman yeah. give that advice? to her parents. Miriam! That's right, all the way back! What does she say? Her parents saw they were going to kill all the Jewish children, boys, and they're like, we're not bringing it, so they divorced. And Miriam says, no, you're worse than him. Parish wants to kill the boys. Right? You're stopping boys and girls coming out. And he remarried because of her advice, and from that came Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe Rabbeinu was born after that advice. So Miriam, the Sadeka, she was like, but the whole Jewish woman herself later on followed that example and the power of the Jewish woman. Wait, so they, they did the same thing, Miriam, since it's a baby. 
she was right. She was the one who told her parents to keep having kids, uh-huh. right? And after that, they had relations and had Moshe Rabbeinu. After that piece of advice, they divorced. They got remarried. You can remarry the same person after divorce, you know that. Unless you marry someone else in between. They never did. And many years later, the Jewish women, the Jewish men were like, we're slaves, we're not having children. Why are we bringing more slaves into Misraim? This is madness. Why should we do this? And Jewish women made sure they did. Even if it's a problem, Mm-hmm. But they're not going at this point. Yeah, no, but I'm saying, like, let's say... No. How did it happen? How did this whole slavery begin? So at first, it was voluntary. Right? Para went out. The Midrash says, I believe... I don't think I've seen this Midrash. Or maybe I did many years ago. He took out a golden brick and held it up. And said, for every brick that you make and bring, what's going to happen? You become rich. So that's where he started them off. So at first, it was a monetary desire. It's important. They made them want this. What happened later? There was no reward. They were slaves. They couldn't have any of it. And eventually, they had to make their own bricks as well. Do you know what Chazal learned out from this? We're going to see later on. A very important lesson. This Egyptian exile was there to curtail the Jewish love for money and success. There, I said it. Snap. Drops the mic. That's what they say. Chazal say that. We're going to see the Chazal. Right? They learned out from this that our whole being can't just be in order to have physical, material pursuit. This Egyptian experience was meant to curtail that desire as well. Even the desire is a good one. I want so I can help and, and do other great things and affect the world through this. It can't be your sole desire. Turn over the page. Just a little bit more. We're flying over here. Let's see what Desla again. So he's going to talk about the exile itself and the physical and spiritual slavery. Remember, there's two forms of avdut we were going through. One was a physical slavery. There was also a spiritual one as well. Right? It was gashmi and ruchni. Gashmiat and ruchniat. It's very, very important. People see, you watch the movies, and they're just physical slaves. That was true, but that wasn't the main slavery. There was a slavery of the mind as well, and the soul as well as the body. And that's Rav Desla. And he says, Kol inyan, There's always an inner aspect. To anything that happens to us, there's an outside layer. That's the physical slavery. But there's also an inside truth and secret that comes as well. You would look and you'd read and you'd watch and whatever you do in order to get information, and be like, yeah, the Jews were slaves, Hashem took us out. But that was the outside, that was the klipa. That was the outside reality. But a person of spiritual sense, roes sees, shagalata gufniet, this physical slavery, hirak hamasofev, was just the outside. There was something much worse than that. Not just the broken body, but the broken spirit. Our souls were trapped as well. Pirush, meaning, That means we were slaves to the Yetzara as well. Now this aspect of it is actually going to be, most people are not aware of this, the reason we celebrate Pesach. We think we celebrate Pesach to remember what happened all those years ago. Because our ancestors were slaves in Egypt and Shem took them out. But why are you celebrating that? So they were slaves and you got out. What's the big deal? It's because Mitzrayim is an ongoing reality. We are all still slaves. I'm not a slave. Okay, I'm married, but I'm not a slave. You know what I'm saying? So what's the, uh, what's the big deal? And the answer is we're all slaves. So I Yetzara, Mitzrayim and Paro. And we're going to see how the word name Paro represents this. Actually, anyone know right now? It's difficult. What do you see? Every word has a secret inside it. What's parua? 
is unbridled, unrolled, unraveled, completely open. What does power represent? The unbridled Yetzirah. Everything was okay. There were no limits. You could do whatever you wanted. The Yetzirah was totally out. Oh, it's unbridled, unwrapped, unraveled. Yeah? Trying to do whatever you Absolutely. Yeah. Hello. That's what it was. It represented the Yetzirah. So we were trapped. We were Mitzar, and power represented that which was totally around. Whatever you wanted to do, it was all good. All right. So, there you go. Ah, oh, it's inside. I remember this from last time. Let's have a look at that. So, Mitzrayim represents physical slavery, but also spiritual slavery as well, the Yetzirah. So when we see later on you go free from Mitzrayim, you're also going free from that as well. That's the, that's the Chayrut. The freedom, that's another very important word, chirut. We'll talk about it later on. That's going to come up later. The Jewish people went free, right? Chirut. We're going to see that word later on when we discuss the Ten Commandments on Shavuot. Write that word down, you're going to need it. So we see Mitzrayim, we see Paro. You know, Paro to Moshe. What's Moshe? Was that Moshe's real? What's Moshe's real name? He had a whole bunch of them. Do you know the real name he was mentioned by? He was known by? What is Paris? His parents didn't call him Moshe. They called him something. Who called him Moshe? Paro? Who called him? Batia. Paro's daughter. When she was by the river, she called him that. Mishituhu. In her mind, she took him out. He was going to be the future redeemer. The name Moshe means to take out. Your name represents your essence. What was his real name, by the way? Is a machloket, Tov or Tovia? Tovia. What's actually his real name? His essence wasn't to take out. His essence. She took him out, that became his essence. That became his mission. And that's his name. We know him as Moshe Rabbeinu. That was a name that not his parents gave so him, that she gave him. Where does Tovia come from? His parents gave him the name. Ah. So when it says Tov or Tovia, he was good. They saw it was good. The Torah itself. Hints it when it says he was told he was good, or told he became good for himself or through a Karish Baruch. Hu. But that's not how we know him. It's interesting, right? He is known by the Egyptian princess's title. So what gave her the right to give him the name? <laughs> she was converting by the river. She was a very holy woman. That's why she was at the Nile, ready to immerse, as I'll say. She was a very great woman. It's my daughter's second name. Yeah. Rachel Batia, actually. And she's dragged my son everywhere. And his name is Moshe. Okay. <laughs> Works out nicely. Ah, so that's that's right. We didn't mention I just mentioned the side because just you have the names represent the mission. So that's Paro. So he's saying uh Mahash of Israel, the, that wasn't his name, it's a title. Paro was a title. Right? Purush Rashi. Parua Mugula. Mugula is revealed. That's the word parua, right? Part of when you we do a circumcision, there's two parts. There's the actual Brit and there's the, the Priya. The, you unroll the skin a little bit. That's Priya. It's unrolled, unraveled. Haray, Shibchina and Hagat Tuma, Shibisrayim. What was the, 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 the main impurity that was there in Mitzrayim? He betichat akvol, it opened up all boundaries. Liyetzer for the Yetzara, Shechol lekanes, the Pashet, cover its honor, making all forms of inroads towards the Yetzara. That's what he represented. That's what he represented. Okay? That's a very important Rav Desla. Summarizes three key points. Not physical, spiritual. Not only physical. That's Mitzrayim and that's Paro. That's what we were up against. We'll do one last piece and we'll finish up. I know we did a lot today. No. We're going to jump to, uh, let's do the Maral. On the next page, on page 50. I will go through, the, this is just introduction, we shall go through all these little elements later. Well, next class we're going to talk about the miracles anyway, and why that's so key. So the Haggadah says, remember the Haggadah is going to be the text that we tell over, the Haggadah Lagid. Right? We tell it over, that's going to be one of the Torah mitzvahs of Pesach to tell over this story. That's the Haggadah. Okay. We'll see the rabbinic mitzvahs, and there's Torah mitzvahs. This is one of the Torah mitzvahs we're going to do on Pesach.
So it says the Haggadah, Bechol dor v'dor, in each and every generation, Chayav Adam, a person is obligated, lirot et atzmo, to see himself, ki'ilu hu yetzam Israel, as though he left Egypt. Pirish, what does that mean? Shekol Adam, every person, Chayav is obligated, shi'aret atzmo, ki'ilu yetzam Israel, that you actually were in Egypt. And that's why it says, This is going to involve telling children. Now we're going to see why children are so important. Let me throw in just another bean into the chillant, if you will. And that is that the focus of Pesach is going to be the children. That's not the focus of Sukkot. It's not the focus of Rosh Hashanah. It's not the focus of Yom Kippur. If you want to teach your kids, it's not the focus of any other Jewish holiday. If you want to get the kids involved, that's a great thing. But Pesach is all about kids. That's going to be a key feature of this story, this event of the mitzvot of Pesach. Why, we shall see. Unlike any other holiday. If the kids want to go early to bed on Sukkot, okay, fine. Right? If seven-year-old wants to go to bed early on Rosh Hashanah, okay, gesund comes Pesach, and now you got to stay up. Okay, we're going to see why that is. And the answer to that is going to be connected to questions, which is going to be another feature of the Haggadah. I'm throwing too much in today, right? What? I'm throwing too much in today. i I got, I got so much to tell you. I can't stop. But let's just focus on this last point. I can't get too thrown off. Says the Haggadah, you have to see yourself as you left Egypt. Let me see myself as I left Egypt. I was never in Egypt. Okay, maybe I'll go on vacation there one time. Right? But why are, we, why are we saying you have to see yourself as though you left Egypt? So the answer is that Egypt wasn't an event. It's an ongoing experience. It's a time and an ongoing experience. It's a concept. That's why it's mentioned in the Pasuk in the first person. Hashem took me out. Which he say? Lord says, Lanu. Right? It says, Lik, Ba'avor Zeh Asali, Hashem did for me. But I'm reading this in 2016, 5776. What do you mean Hashem took me out? I, 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 I wasn't there. What do you mean Hashem took me out? And the answer is, because you were there. But I wasn't there. You're in Egypt. Everyone's in Egypt. Egypt is an ongoing reality. Just like a Malik are constantly there to get us, we're constantly, as we said on Purim, we're constantly in this world called Mitzrayim. We are all trapped by the Yitzharat, and that's going to be a major key part of Pesach and all the mitzvot that we do on Pesach, from cleaning out the chametz, from eating matzah, from leaning, drinking the wine, telling of the Gada, is all going to revolve around fixing this problem and getting our kids involved as well. It's all going to come and emperor up and answer this concept of us being slaves. Did everyone see today's tapestry? Can you see there's, a, there's an arc we covered today? It started with Amravinu, took us into Mitzrayim, and is going to take us to Har Sinai. It's all one collective whole. It's not separate random events that happen to happen to us. It's all connected. All right, we'll stop over there. We did a lot today. I know.